Welcome to our review of a prototype copy of Flicking Finches. I want to start out by thanking Meriday Games for sending us a prototype of Flicking Finches to check out. Uh, Flicking Finches was designed by and features art from Eve's Tourney. Right now, the game only exists in prototype form, but Meriday Games hopes to have it published by 2022 through the help of Kickstarter. Now, a game of Flicking Finches takes about half an hour to play and takes plays two to four players. As a disclaimer, we really don't recommend flicking real finches. They're quite pretty, and we don't support animal abuse. Flicking Finches is a flicking-based dexterity game set in the Galapagos Islands. Players play a flock of finches who are flying around the islands trying to catch the attention of Charles Darwin, hoping that they will get sketched into his sketchbook and get rewarded with some seeds. The trick is that Darwin is studying evolution, and he'll be looking for finches with different characteristics for his book. These include size, beak design, and feather pattern. The winner is the player controlling the flock that earns the most seeds by the end of the game. The version of Flicking Finches we're talking about today is a prototype copy. Due to this, we did not bother recording an unboxing video, and as usual with the, one of these previews, everything said here is subject to change. Now, in this case, though, unlike my review of Battle of Gog a couple weeks ago, the designer does consider this game to be finished and complete. Now, there is a chance something will come up during the Kickstarter or based on other feedback from other people doing previews right now. That's not expected. It's not expected anything that will change. Now, there are a couple changes planned, but they won't affect gameplay. One is to shrink the box down so it fits in your typical board game shelf something we've suggested before, and to change the color of the egg components. But other than that, everything should stay the same. No constantly interfacing with the designer on rule questions, then? No, we have been back and forth on a couple things that I did ask for clarification on, and a couple suggestions I had, which we'll actually get to when I get to my final thoughts. Now, despite being a prototype, the components in my copy of Flicking Finches are excellent. Like, I own published games that have worse components than this. Uh, the finches themselves are wooden discs with stickers on them in two different sizes and four different player colors. Uh, one of my suggestions being you might want to try more colorblind friendly colors. Darwin is a wooden pawn that looks like it's wearing a hat, just a, a round, not a meeple, but a pawn. Um, there are also four wooden egg tokens. Mine are in blue, but the final version will have these in the four player colors. Now, the sketchbook cards are pretty good quality. Now, the most impressive component by far in flicking finches is the play mat. This is a nice, thick neoprene mat that features the game board, as well as a rather detailed summary of play up in one corner. Everything on the mat is clear and easy to see, and the wooden discs slide well on it. Now, I haven't gotten my hands on this one, just seen what everyone can on Board Game Geek. So how do you play this evolution-themed board game? So you place the play mat in the center of the table, shuffle the sketchbook cards, and flip up five of them. Each player takes all the finches in their chosen color. Eggs are placed by the side of the board. The player to the left of the start player, who Sean's going to hate because it's the last person to have fed a bird, sorry, Sean, picks one of their finches and hatches it. This is done by placing the finch disc on any one of the three nesting sites and giving it one flick. No, you're not really aiming for anything here because Darwin isn't placed yet. Now, the third and fourth player do the exact same, but hatch two finches. Once all the finches are hatched, then it gets back to the start player, who places the Darwin pawn on any of the eight observation spots and then takes their first turn. See, and this game was going so well, right up until the start player determination. <laughs> now, each player turn starts with you having the option to evolve one of your finches that are already in play. Each finch has three characteristics, size, beak shape, and color. And color actually here, or pattern, is striped or not. Now, to evolve, you remove a finch from the board and replace it with another finch that is only different from the original one in one aspect and one aspect only. A well, pretty questionable example of evolution, but no one said this was a STEM game. And actually, when we get to my final thoughts, there is a really good quote about this included in the game. Now, after potentially evolving a finch, you get three actions. The possible actions, which can be taken in any order or more than once, are evolve. This is the same as what I just described, but is in addition to the evolution you get for free at the start of the turn. Hatch, take a finch from your supply, put it on a nesting site and flick it once. The nesting site used is based on where Darwin is, so you end up starting far away from him no matter what. Note you can also use an egg to get a free hatch action. As for how you get those, that'll be in a second. Fly, flick a finch that's on the board. 
Now, if you knock into Darwin, he gets upset and moves to the next observation site on the board. Bumping into other finches, though, is perfectly fine. Now, if you do manage to knock an opponent's fish off the, finch off the board from flicking, you return that finch back to the supply, but they get to take an egg. And again, eggs can be spent to take a free hatch action later. Now, if you do flick or knock off one of your own finches on the board, that's your bet. You just have to put it back into your supply and get no reward for that. Next is to chirp. You do this to get Darwin's attention. Each observation location on the board has a series of concentric rings around it. When you use the church chirp action, you first check to see if there are any finches in the rings. If there are none, Darwin hears the chirp but can't see any birds, so he moves to the next spot. If there are finches, Darwin will sketch the finch that is closest to him as long as it matches at least one characteristic shown on at least one of the face-up cards. The owner of that finch will then take it from the board and place it on one of the sketchbook cards, trying to match as many properties as possible. And again, there are three things, size, color, and pattern. Each sketchbook card can only hold one finch. Once all the Facebook face-up sketchbook cards are filled, a new set of five are drawn from the deck. Once the third set of cards are filled, 15 total, the game does end. No, despite the fact that chirping is how you want to get drawn, you may want to do this when there's no finches nearby just to move Darwin or to be nasty and get Darwin to sketch an opponent's bird that doesn't fit any of the currently face-up cards well. So there's a number of different aspects at play here. Honestly, from the brief description of the game, I was expecting something quite a bit lighter than this. Mm -hmm. But this is more than just flick a bird meeple closer to the main meeple than everyone else. This isn't a game of horseshoes with birds. No. <laughs> no, it, it honestly sounded like it was going to be like curling when I first heard about it. There is definitely more going on. Now, the game ends when all 15 sketchbook cards have a finch on them. Now, note if a player does run out of finches before this, their turns just skip. So everyone else keeps playing until all the cards are filled. Points are then rewarded for how many characteristics each finch matches to the card. One seed's rewarded for one match, three seeds for two matches, and five for perfectly matching the card. Player with the most seeds wins the game. I've not really hidden my general meh attitude towards flicking games, but I have to say I kind of want to try this one just to see if it can be as tactical as it seems. Now, in addition to these rules, there is an optional rule of adding clouds to the game. Now, the game comes with these three fairly large bubbly wooden clouds. When using this expansion, the first player, before anyone's hatched any finches, can place them anywhere on the board as long as they don't cover up a nesting site or observation area. So now that we know how to play, what are your thoughts on flicking finches? I'm pretty sure fans of the show know how much I love dexterity games. I love games where you stack, balance, or flick things. It's this love of dexterity games that made me jump at a chance to check out flicking finches. And honestly, to try to help make this game a reality. Indeed, this is certainly a game fine-tuned for your preferences, even if the theme may not be something that really sucks you in at first. I gotta say, I like the premise. Like, I, I like the evolution theme. Like, it has come up before, right? That's what Dominant Species is all about, and well, there's a game from North Star Games called Evolution, all about evolution. And there's various versions of that with Ocean's Evolution and so on. But honestly, it's really not a common theme. And honestly, this is the first super easy gateway evolution themed game. And it's also completely family friendly. So this is the first evolution game for kids as far as I'm concerned. And I gotta say, I love this excerpt from the rule book that I kind of hinted at earlier. Important disclaimer, evolution does not work in the manner presented in this game. Instead, it is a lengthy process of diversification and selection that unfolds over many generations and does not entail quite as much flicking. Gotta love a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. After all, this is a game, folks. Now, the theme is actually pretty well integrated into the game way in ways that just make sense. Like, to me, I just found it really simple to explain this game to the kids. I basically sat down and said, look, you want Darwin to notice you because he'll give you seeds, and you like seeds. Darwin is looking for specific things, though, and he'll give more seeds to birds he wants to draw. So you want to look at his sketchbook to see what he wants to draw and then try to get a bird that matches one of those sketches as close as possible to him and chirp to get noticed. But be careful not to hit him because that'll scare him off and he'll move to another point on the island. Like, that was basically my introduction of the game to the kids. Note to self, dive bombing scientist isn't a helpful trait for selection. 
Yes. Which is why we no longer have any dive bombing finches left in the world today. Now, I've already mentioned how much I dig the playmat for this game. Now, in addition to being well-designed and practical, I love neoprene for flicking games. Like this style of game mat just works great because it provides some friction, but not too much. So it's unlike flicking on a wooden table where the dish just goes everywhere, but it's also not enough that you can't flick it and get it going. And I actually find neoprene really makes it easier to control your flicks after a little practice on the surface. Yeah, for people not used to flicking on neoprene, it will not, may not behave in the way you expect. Make sure you get the practice mm. in before you sit down and really start a game. Although this is the kind of game you play it and you practice in your first round and you get better at it. That's what my kids do. They, they, they admit they, they were not giving it enough. They, they were in the middle. They were either flick it all the way across the board or barely move it. But by the end of the second game we played, they were going pretty good. Like they, they, they had picked it up. Now, one of the things I do suggest, though, is to get that cloud expansion in play as soon as possible. Uh, if you played any games before any flicking games, just throw them out there the first time. Because without the clouds, even at the maximum player count of four people, but even more so when you're only playing with two, the board's kind of empty. What this does is make the game in a way easier and in a way harder. And in not good ways. Like, it's way easier to flick way too hard and end up off the map because there's nothing to get in the way. And on the opposite end, for an experienced flicker who's used to neoprene, it can be way too easy to reach Darwin in just one flick. Because again, there's nothing in the way. There's nothing to make it more difficult. Adding the clouds gives you something to run into, bounce off of, and you can do neat stuff like flick the clouds to move them to cover up spots of the map or block access to Darwin or cover over a nest and things like that. It, adds a, it definitely adds a more tactical level to the game. So much like in pitch car, uh, when you've got a track without rails, you just need to be so much more careful when there's nothing you can hit to make mm -hmm. sure that flick is just perfect or it's gone. <laughs> now, my only complaint about this game really is in regards to the Finch images on the sketchbook cards. Well, two of the characteristics that you're looking for in this game are really easy to tell apart at a glance. The pattern, which is striped or not, and the beak type, which is either thin and pointy or thick. The, that, that's easy. The problem is size can be hard to differentiate. The, the big isn't that much bigger than the small. And the other thing is, if you don't have anything to compare it to, it's almost impossible. So if you happen to draw five cards that are all small or five cards that are all big, or as you're playing, you're covering up one. So you've covered up all the big ones. It's really hard to tell if something's large or small. I, I do note that there are no images of the cards from the designer on the Board Game Geek page. So this may be something they're aware of and plan to fix before final release. I will admit I did bring it up to them. I did make a suggestion because they have a circle around them. And I suggested making the circle big or small, but they said then... They tried that in playtesting, but players then thought only small birds could go on the small ones and only big birds, excuse me, only small birds can go on the small ones, only big birds go on the big. And again, you don't have to match all three of the things. You want to for the most points, but it made people think you couldn't, which is a bad part of the game. So I just think they need to shrink the small, smaller, and make the big bigger, in my opinion. But Now, another thing to be aware of, this is not a fault of the game. This is by design. This is a very light game. As I've already mentioned, this could be played by gamers of all ages. There, there isn't any reading required. And even the youngest of gamers should be able to flick a finch and can easily be helped with the rest of the rules. This was the problem my girls have with this game. Like, I thought they were going to love this. And after playing it, they were just, nah. Now, I have to admit, I introduced them to other games first. They played Pitch Car. But more importantly, a game called Flick Wars. This is a tactical miniature game that features flicking. This is something you can read about over on the blog or watch on YouTube. We've covered this. And they also played Rail Pass as a dexterity game where you're basically playing a sorting algorithm. And they just felt there wasn't enough going on in flicking finches to keep them interesting. Like they said, it was fun. We, we would play it again, but I'd rather play something else. I'd rather play something with more meat. They don't know the term meat, but they, they're like, I want to play something with more to it. Which is interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say you're developing board game snobs. Uh, not yeah. at all. But at the same point, uh, I'm actually interested in it because there is more than, say, Ice Cool, where you're yeah. just flicking a penguin around to a different room. Mm -hmm. There is strategy and there is, you know, you're trying to make sure the, 
the most evolutions match and all that because and that that's what actually interests me because there is more to it than yes. your bog standard flicking game no i gotta admit i think it's really cool i think this game's really neat and very well done but like the kids is kind of the target market and they didn't really take to it so right. i don't know what what i'm thinking though is this is going to be a perfect gateway flicking game if you are thinking of getting your family, your gamers, your kids, whatever, into playing more flicking games, do people do that? Like, I know people have tried to play an 18xx. Are people like, I want to get to pitch car? That's a, I don't know. But if it is, it's a gateway. It's a great way because, like, this is especially like Flick Wars, like I said, which is a war game where you have units moving, you're attacking each other. I, if I ever had to teach someone Flick Wars, I'd be like, here, play this first, and now we'll play Flick Wars because it just kind of gives you the, that mechanics. I think I think is this is good practice for games like Ice Cool and Pitch Car. So with some of the uh, cool Ice Cool TikToks out there, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if people gave up on that game, assuming it was already just beaten. We're over that. <laughs> no, the, those moves, are, you know how many takes they took to make some of those. Uh, one hundred thirty-seven, I believe, was the one. There <laughs> you go. See, that's just it, right? Yeah, you, if you can't pull it off every time, the game's not broken. <laughs> Now, overall, I gotta say, I was really impressed by this. I, I, I'm smitten with it is almost a, a way to word it. Like, I, I love the theme of this game. I like the way it's integrated into game. But yes, I know it's not realistic, but the whole, oh, I want to evolve my Finch because he's looking to sketch one with a smaller beak and the one I have out is a fat beak. I like that. And I like the whole flick and chirp and trying to chirp to, to backstab my opponents. I think that's really neat. I, I like the way... You're trying, and even the thing, like you're trying to get seeds, right? Like you're like, I got to look perfect for Darwin and I have to get close enough, but not too close. Cause if I bump him, he gets scared. Uh, if this, this very friendly theme and simple gameplay thing, I think this is a great family game, especially for families with younger kids that might even lead to a conversation about evolution and, and, and be a bit of a learning experience. Like, yes, no, it didn't quite work this way. But like when I learned, I learned about Titsi flies, the finches evolving to have different beaks is way cooler than Titsi flies to me. With this though, I can see the simplicity of this game turning off older gamers or more experienced gamers. Uh, while it's a lot of fun, there's really not a ton of strategy or tactics or depth of the game. I thought it was a quick, neat, fun game. I'm glad I got to check it out. And I wholeheartedly wish Meridia Games luck with their Kickstarter. Well, that's it for our look at Flicking Finches. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com and check out Flicking Finches when it goes live on Kickstarter. <laughs>